Y'all have any particular questions though that you want to deal with first? No. Well, I want to look at these um, these free response questions because this is what you're gonna have. It'll be a lot like this. You'll have a two lens. So <coughs> excuse me, a two lens system. I'm not gonna go through the whole thing right now. But in the two lens system, you treat it like two different problems. So you have a problem with a single lens right here. And then whatever image is created by that single lens then becomes the object for the second lens. So for example, I would have f1 is equal to 20, uh, p1 is equal to 30. I got that from right here and right here. And then I would find q1. q1, I would say, well, 1 over f equals 1 over p plus 1 over q. Then that's 1 over... 20 equals 1 over 30 plus 1 over Q. Oh, I see that's 3 over 60 minus 2 over 60. So Q is equal to 60 centimeters. And then the magnification M1 would be negative Q divided by P. That's 60 over 30, which is equal to negative 2. So my first image would be twice the height of this object, and it would be inverted, and it would be 60 centimeters. That means that the object here would be 20 centimeters. And then you go through the same process for the second lens. Okay, I think y'all, those are pretty straightforward, right? I think y'all know how to do those? Okay, if not, we'll come back to it. You let me know. Uh, this is probably the more difficult question. because It's going to be like this. It'll look a lot like this. But depending upon the orientation and size of the of the image, it could be a different mirror or it could be a lens. So you need to know all those different mirrors and lenses, the types of images that they form, in order to solve this problem correctly. That's important. That is that I have to know what type of mirror it is because I asked that question, but also because the sign of the focal length is dependent on the, upon the type of mirror or lens. So if this is a convex mirror, which I think in this case it is, yeah, if this is a convex mirror, then uh, the focal length will be negative. The reason that we know that it is a convex mirror is because the image is smaller, right? The object is four centimeters high, and the image is two centimeters. So that means that the magnification is one half, and then also the magnification is positive. So I have an upright smaller image that means that it's a convex mirror where this is my object and this is my image because I have an upright smaller image now if it was an upright bigger image then that would be a concave mirror right because you remember the concave mirror if my image my object is right there then my image is right there so knowing those lenses and mirrors and the types of images that they form is important for this question. It's important for other questions, too. So my magnification is equal to positive one-half. We have an order to fix this pen. They're supposed to replace it, so I'm really sorry. It's just the writing is messy. Um, so I'm going to set up two equations. First is that the magnification, which is 1 over 2, is equal to negative Q divided by P, and then the second is 1 over um, F, and now F is going to be, it's a convex mirror, so F is going to be equal to negative 5. The way that I got that, as I said, this center of curvature is 10 centimeters, and I divide it by 2, because the focal length is half the center of curvature. So 1 over negative 5 equals 1 over Q plus 1 over P. Now the next step is going to be to solve this system of two equations. The easiest way to do that is to take this first equation. I like to cross multiply where I say this times this is equal to that times that. That would be that P is equal to negative 2Q. P is equal to negative 2Q. Um, so then I take this and I substitute it in over here where I had P. That would be 1 over negative 5 equals 1 over, 1 over Q plus 1 over 
negative 2 cubed. Okay? Then I would solve this equation. 1 over negative 5 equals 1 over q plus 1 over negative 2 q. Solve that equation for q, and I'll, I'll leave you to do that on your own. Okay? But that's how it's going to be. You're going to have to figure out what is the, the lens or mirror, what is the, then does it have a positive or negative focal length, and then do this solution that's solving the system of two equations. We did this last semester in Chapter 4 with the inclined plane, but I want you to, I want to see it again before y'all before leave. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, you need to know how to draw your rays for these lenses, and then you also need to know how to do a diffraction grading. The diffraction grading problem is going to look a lot like this, exactly like this, in fact, except the numbers are going to be different. Okay. The first step is to figure out what is the slit spacing. Let's just take one divided by that number and then convert it into meters. 1 divided by 8,000 and convert it into meters. And then you have to find the distance from the central maximum. Remember, so with that, the first thing that you do is you find theta, where you say d sine theta equals m lambda. And then the next thing that you do is you say that y equals l tan theta. Okay? So you first solve for theta, and then you solve for y. And that y distance is the answer that you're looking for. So that would be the distance from here to here in this problem, because I'm looking at the second bright spot. That would be y, and that, that is the answer that you're looking for. Okay? That one's definitely on there exactly like it is. All these are on there. Uh, the ray diagram, it could be this one, it's probably going to be a different one, but it could be this one, but it, uh, and it could be either a lens or a mirror. So just know those ray diagrams. It'll help you with the other things too if you know how to do the ray diagrams. Alright, that's the free response. That's eight questions. That's a quarter of your exam. No, no, a third of your exam. Alright, yeah, a third. Alright, what other questions y'all have? Y'all have particular questions? Spring 20, number 17. Yeah. Oh, also remember, like I said in class today, there is no single slit diffraction. Zero single slit. Nothing, not conceptual, not calculations, no single slit. So uh, we just, since we weren't in class on Monday, I didn't want to. Yeah, number 15, where you have this convex lens. This one? 17. Why? What do you saw? What do you find when you find M? Yeah. Let's see. So let's. So you will see a question like this. All right. And the way that you do this. To find, if I'm looking for the, the maximum number of orders, that is, how many spots do I have on my screen from this diffraction grading, you're going to set theta equal to 90 degrees. Because at 90 degrees, imagine double slit. At 90 degrees, that's where your light is no longer reaching the screen, okay, because it's going off into infinity. So I set theta equal to 90 degrees, and then I say d sine of 90 which is equal to 1, is equal to m lambda. So m, then, is equal to d divided by lambda. So here, d is uh, 1 over 600 times 10 to the minus 3. So to find d, I do 1 divided by 600. Uh, and then I multiply that times 10 to the minus 3 to convert it into meters. So I get a slit separation of 1.7 times 10 to the minus 6. And then I divide that by lambda, which is uh, 450 times 10 to the minus 9. So I get 3.7. Yeah, so it should be 7. What was the answer in the back? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So look at what this question is asking. This isn't asking for how many spots are on the screen. It's asking for what is the highest order. Yeah. But on your test, I'm going to ask for the number of spots. Okay. 
Okay, so you calculate the highest order, and then you double it, and you add one. And the area is at zero quarter. I think I got the three. Yeah. Yeah, I don't usually like to have questions that are, the, you know, just one word, but. No, 24 is what we did, that last little section, the Fresnel diffraction, uh, no on 24, and then 25 is single slit, so no on 25, okay? But you will see all these other questions that will be similar, different but similar, you know, is this constructive or destructive interference? The peaks and the troughs line up, so that's destructive, right? You'll have these where they're offset. Look, this one is the peaks and the troughs line up. So which is it on this one? Do y'all know? So what? Uh, yeah, 180. Right, 180. And then if it was not this but not constructive, then that would be 90. I'm never going to give you a 45. It's just really hard to tell what is the 45. Okay? Just to, So if it's not 180 and it's not 0, then you know it's 90. Okay, um, you're going to have one like this where I ask you what's the minimum path or what is the path length difference. Y'all know this one right here, this one's zero, so what is this one? That's one wavelength. This one? This one? Okay, right, yeah, y'all got that. That's not hard, right? It's just zero, one, two, three, four wavelengths, and then in between. You'll have one like this. It, it might not be this peak. It'll probably be some other peak or one of the troughs. Uh, and then the other part that's really the students get tripped up on is one light like number 23. So here I have uh, two, wave, two waves that have the same wavelength, lambda. So lambda equals 4. Uh, and then they travel these two different distances. And delta L here is equal to 2. So I have a path length difference of 2 meters, a wavelength of 4 meters. That means that the path length difference is one half of the wavelength. So that gives me what kind of interference? Half, what is it? Destructive, total destructive. So a half a wavelength means that I've shifted over like that. So my peaks and my troughs are lining up. And that means I'm going to get total destructive interference. If this was, say, 8 meters, delta L was 8 meters, what would the answer be? Constructive. And if delta L was, say, I don't know, 3 meters, what would the answer be? It would be partial. It would be neither total nor, no, neither total constructive nor destructive. So I'm looking for, is it a wavelength? Is it a half wavelength? Or is it something in between? Uh, this A would be a wavelength, a half wavelength, and something in between. Okay? Gosh, this chapter's easy, right? Is this an easy chapter? It's, it's not hard. It's just we haven't seen it that much because we were out. And, but it's not a real long chapter. And, um, with a little practice, I, I think y'all can do really well on this chapter. Okay? Sure. Yeah, so this one, concave lenses and convex mirrors. So concave lenses, remember, look like this. I think I have a problem where you have to cut, like, just name the lens for me. Uh, as light goes into them, that light goes like, goes like that. So that is a diverging device. The light waves diverge. And then likewise, for convex mirrors, Light comes in and it diverges like that. Okay, those are diverging devices. Whereas concave mirrors and convex lenses, those are both converging devices. I'm going to give you a question like this where you have to get the rays. I'm pretty sure I gave you one like that. Um, one like number seven. Number one. 
No, no, there's no I stuff on it. Uh, yeah, we didn't get to do that very much, so no I. There's no I stuff. We spent more time on that in the past, but we didn't spend any time on that. Oh, chromatic aberration? Yes. Like this for what type? For your I? No, no word I does not occur. Okay. Yeah, but this does? Yeah, you need to know your aberrations, your chromatic and spherical aberrations. So, spherical aberrations, there's just one question about it. It's either about chromatic or spherical. Uh, so, spherical aberrations occur because light comes in to different points on the lens and it focuses at a particular point. And then light comes at a different part of the lens and it focuses at a different point like that. So, um, that would be spherical aberration. Whereas chromatic aberration is you get a light of a different color that focuses at a different part of the, at a part. And the reason that is because we know that the index of refraction is dependent upon the wavelength. We saw that in chapter six. That's why prisms work. So the way that you get rid of spherical aberrations is where you use an aperture. Your pupil is an aperture. Cameras use an aperture like that. I guess I might ask you that. The pupil is an aperture that's meant to get rid of spherical aberration. I don't remember uh, getting all my tests mixed up. Okay. The pupil is an aperture to limit, right? What does it get rid of? Spherical aberration. I don't remember if that's the question. I'm not telling you that's what it is, but I just want to make sure you know that. Number two. Okay, so aberrations can occur in mirrors and in lenses, but what kind of aberration only occurs in one of those? Let me give you a hint. It's the aberration that has to do with the index of refraction being dependent upon wavelength. That's the chromatic. So chromatic aberrations only occur in lenses because they depend upon the index of refraction. Uh, but the other aberrations can occur in mirrors and uh, can also can occur in mirrors. So chromatic and spherical both occur in mirrors, but spherical but lenses only experience. Excuse me, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Um, chromatic aberrations do not occur in mirrors but lenses, spherical, and chromatic. So mirrors, you got spherical and chromatic. But lenses, I just need to write cursive all the time. Lenses uh, only have, no, shoot, I'm sorry, no chromatic here, uh, have spherical and chromatic. All right, that mirrors only spherical, lenses spherical and chromatic, and it's because the uh, this is dependent upon the index of refraction, and the index of refraction doesn't relate to mirrors at all. It doesn't affect mirrors. Okay. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Is that all? Yeah, number 20. Okay, so you could see something like this. In fact, you will. Where 
if you change some variable regarding a double slit diffraction pattern, and remember that is given by this D times sine theta is equal to M times lambda. Uh, so if I if I double the slit separation, so I doubled this value, uh, I want to know what happens to the distance between the adjacent light and dark fringes. Well, I know that y is equal to L tan theta. So if d goes up by a factor of 2, that means that sine theta drops by a factor of a half. They're inversely related to one another. If one goes up, the other goes down. And if sine theta goes down by half, that also does the same to tan theta. You can just say sine theta is equal to tan theta is equal to theta. And because our angles are all small, that is true. You probably talked about the small angle approximation in calculus. So we'll, we'll assume that that's true. Uh, and if tan theta goes down by a factor of a half, that means that the distance between the fringes is going to go down also by a factor of a half. But I could phrase this in other ways, like I could say, what happens if lambda goes up? If lambda goes up by a factor of 2, that means this goes up by a factor of 2. This would go up by a factor of 2, and this would go up by a factor of 2. I guess that's really the only way that I could change that. Yeah, if lambda goes up, it's a direct relationship with theta. So if this increased by 2, this would increase by 2. This would increase by 2, and this would also increase by 2. That's right, yeah. So if this quadruple, this would quarter, this would quarter, and this would quarter. Okay? I think that's all the different types of problems for Chapter 8. Um, it's really the free response, making sure that y'all have that down cold. That you can do it fast and without really thinking that much. That's really what, where you want to be for the free response. All right. I'm going to go ahead and stop here.